Well, I'm sure you probably heard, especially if you surf the Internet a lot, about the Bush statement just a week or so ago when he said, I will argue that Saddam Hussein out of power has made the world a better place and a safer place. Uh, he said, uh, oh, he goes on and on and on, and he talks about the uh, threat from terrorists and so forth, and he says, our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. In other words, we don't stop thinking about ways to harm our country and our people. Uh, just one more Bush malapropism. One more time when he misspoke, and strangely enough, this was from a written text. This was part of a speech that he gave, a campaign speech. And I bring this up not to make fun of George Bush, but to call attention to the obvious, and that is that the man has no core, no center, no philosophy, no approach to government, no anything. He just simply reads speeches, and you can see it when he answers questions from reporters or interviewers that he's virtually tongue-tied. He has no point of view that he is trying to express to the world. All he wants to do is to be president. And it's very, very difficult to see how anybody can really believe in George Bush, really want George Bush to, quote, lead this country, as George Bush always points out, I'm the leader, I'm the commander-in-chief, I have to lead this country, so forth and so on. And, of course, you can imagine I don't really want anybody leading me anywhere. I'd like to make my own decisions. But it is difficult to understand how anybody could really be for George Bush, really could be enthusiastic and think, oh, boy, he's such a good president, I want him for four more years. But then there's John Kerry. John Kerry obviously has no center, no core, no political philosophy either. Uh, he probably does not flip-flop nearly as much as the Bush people would like to make you believe, but there's no question that Kerry invites that kind of criticism because he doesn't have a thought-out philosophy. He doesn't know what he wants to do about Iraq. He doesn't believe that our foreign policy is wrong and must be changed. He doesn't know what a foreign policy should be. And he doesn't know whether he believes that the Vietnam War was right or wrong or indifferent or upside down or backwards or on the wrong page or what. Uh, and, of course, his speeches are so boring that you can't imagine that anybody could be enthusiastic about him. So how in the world can anybody be for John Kerry? How can anybody be enthusiastic and think, oh, boy, this is the man I want to be in the White House for the next four years? Well, the point I'm trying to get at here is that the two-party system in America, which has been imposed by fiat, by campaign finance laws, ballot access laws, and in different ways, has created a situation where you have two parties who are really not different from each other in any significant ideological or philosophical way. They are both just competing for votes on whatever basis seems expedient at the moment. And they tend to nominate for the presidency real mediocre candidates. On the Republican side, people like George Bush Sr., Robert Dole, George W. Bush, uh, Gerald Ford. On the Democratic side, you have Jimmy Carter, Walter Mondale, Michael Dukakis, John Kerry, probably the only people that could inspire anybody in either, from either party were Ronald Reagan on the Republican side and Bill Clinton on the Democratic side, the only people who could inspire anybody in recent years. And, of course, I'm not saying either one of them was my idea of a good president. All I'm saying is that they at least had or presented the picture of someone who really believed in something and was trying to do something that somebody else might get excited about. What we have instead in this country is not a politics in which people are enthusiastic about their candidates. We have a politics of fear and hate. People vote today at the presidential level and to a great extent also at the congressional level, senatorial level, and state level. They do not vote for any particular person. They vote against the other side. They vote against the people they are afraid of. They vote against the people they have been taught to hate. People will vote for George Bush this year because they will do anything to keep the Democrats out of the White House. People will vote for John Kerry because they believe anybody but Bush uh, is going to be better in the White House. People vote against what they don't want. This is not just an interesting phenomenon. It's a very dangerous phenomenon. 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 Well, I've got my tongue twisted here. Let me tell you a little story. At the end of World War I, the Allies imposed this horrendous peace on Germany, made them responsible for everything that happened in the war, even though it wasn't Germany that started the war. The war started between Austria and uh, Serbia, and Germany entered it as Russia did and as France and uh, Britain did and eventually the United States did. But Germany was made to be responsible for the entire war. They were devastated. The territory was taken away from them. Whole German populations were moved into Czechoslovakia, into France, and into other uh, countries like Poland. And the Germans were humiliated and uh, forced to accept a horrendous set of peace terms. 
1923, France decided, the French government decided, that the only way to keep the Germans down in the future was to break up the German state and let the various provinces become nation states, as they had once been. And they were going to start with Bavaria, the southernmost uh, province, which contains Munich. And in 1923, in the first step in that process, the French moved into the Ruhr Valley of Germany, just simply invaded the valley and took it over. An act of war, obviously. But the Germans had no way of defending themselves because all of their military uh, armaments and navy and, and uh, so forth had been taken away from them by the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. This was a terrible shock to the German people because the world uh, evinced no outrage about the act of war of the French invading Germany. But finally, in Munich there were a group of people called the People's Party. It was a tiny, tiny, tiny little political party. And I think in Munich it had only about a dozen members. But they got together and they organized the protest. And one man led this protest, and they managed to get about a 1,000 people to march on the city hall in Munich as protest against the state of Bavaria, going along with the French desire to break the, the state of Bavaria off of and away from the German nation. The leader of this protest was arrested, he was tried in court for treason, and he was sentenced to eight years in prison. He actually wound up serving about 18 months. I'm not sure of the exact amount, but it was less than two years. And while in prison, he wrote a book about his feelings about all this and about the future of Germany and so on. The important thing is that because he led this protest, he almost overnight became something of a national hero and a national martyr when he went to prison. And as a result, this obscure little individual became an important part of politics in Germany in 1923, and ten years later, he became the Chancellor of Germany. His name, if you haven't figured it out by now, was Adolf Hitler. And the point I want to make is that it wasn't that people loved Adolf Hitler, at least not at the beginning. It was that he was the only one who would stand up against the hated French. He was the only one who was playing to the fears of the German people of what the French might do to Germany to just smash it, break it up into little pieces, and so on. This is what happens when people succumb to the politics of fear and hate. It is only a short step from voting for George Bush because you can't stand the Democrats or voting for John Kerry because Bush has become, been such a terrible president and you have grown to hate him for all the things that he have done, has done. It is only a short step from that sort of thing to getting behind somebody like Adolf Hitler, who, sure, in his book, said some things I don't agree with, but at least this guy is standing up for Germany against these hated enemies that we have. And in 1933, he came to power. He, his party had never won a majority in Parliament, but he came to power, and it wasn't long before he suspended parliamentary procedures, suspended elections, and became the absolute dictator of Germany. Even then, even as the dictator, even as he was squashing civil rights, most people in Germany stood behind him because he was standing up to the enemy. He was standing up against those hated people in Europe who had done so much to hurt Germany with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. This, again, is what happens when people succumb to the politics of hate and fear. It is so important that you not become a pawn of a political party, that you do not sell your soul to the Republicans or the Democrats and say, I've got to stick with the Republicans and whomever they nominate, and whatever it is they say they want, and whatever it is they stand for, because it would be so much worse if it were the Democrats. And it is just as wrong to stand with the Democrats and go along with whomever they nominate for whatever office, and whatever they stand for, and whatever position they take, you will go along with, because it's better than letting the Republicans get their way. That is the road to serfdom. And the serfdom begins by giving up your own independent thought. God, I know so many Republicans who are saying things that are the exact opposite of what they said five or ten years ago, simply because before they believed these things because Bill Clinton was saying the opposite, and now they have switched 180 degrees because the Republicans have switched 180 degrees. And as a result of that, they have simply given up their thought and sold their souls to their party. And, of course, the Democrats have done the same thing. The Democrats who supported Bill Clinton's bombing of uh, Serbia twice during the 1990s, getting into all that, and supported that and said the U.S. must be the world's policeman and enter all of these things. And then when it was George Bush that wanted to do the same thing, the Democrats, uh, so many of them, suddenly uh, changed completely and said they had to do the opposite. When you join a political party that way, you are selling your soul. It reminds me of the anti-drug commercial that doesn't play anymore that used to, where the father would hold up the egg in front of the son and point to the egg and say, this is your brain, and then 
crack open the egg and drop the egg, uh, the inside of the egg, onto the hot skillet where it would sizzle, and he would say, "This is your brain on drugs." Well, that's your brain when you join a political party. And by join it, I don't mean send in your membership dues, but just sell your soul to it and decide that you're going to support it, whatever happens. It just simply is not going to work to your favor. You're going to wake up one day and say to yourself, my God, what has happened to me that I am supporting all these ridiculous positions that this party is holding and promoting these days? Aren't I better than that? Can't I at least go back to the principles I once believed in and that I was fighting for and that were the reason I joined this party? The party has left me. The party has gone down a different road. I don't have to go down that road. I can stand for what I believe in. And as I've said before, it is better not to vote at all than to vote for somebody you don't believe in, to vote for somebody who is doing the opposite of what you want. If you want smaller government, the first step is to stop supporting those who are making government bigger. Well, enough of that. Let's now go to the real world and talk with Brian in Florida. Good evening, Brian. Good evening, Brian. So, what's on your mind tonight? Well, you know, you're talking about the two-party system and all. Uh... I just wonder when I heard that you were going to be shooting a TV pilot. Uh-huh. And was, is Aaron Russo involved in that? or No, he's not. Uh, for the benefit of those who don't know what Brian's talking about, I have mentioned before that I'm involved in a project where we will be shooting a TV pilot at the end of this month for a new one-hour show uh, meant to be on national cable an hour every week called the Liberty Hour with Harry Brown. And there will be no developments on that until after the pilot has been completed and the producer goes to work to try to sell it to a national cable network. And I have high hopes that we will be able to sell it, but there's no guarantee of that, of course. And I will certainly keep you informed in the moment that there is a real development. Uh, you'll certainly know about it just by listening to this broadcast. Brian, you still with us? Yeah, the other thing I was saying, you know, I'm definitely a libertarian, you know, voting from Buckle Bad Network. Um, I don't believe he outreaches to the non libertarians the way that you did when, when when you were running. I always thought when you were running that if you could ever get into the debate or something, that that you would change everybody's mind. I don't feel the same way about Buckle Bad Network. I think he's an articulate guy, and I think that, but I think he speaks as though he's speaking to all libertarians, and that's pretty good opinion on that. Well, I really haven't heard him speak that much. I saw him in the debate at the convention, and I've seen his television ads, and I just can't think of any other occasion where I've heard him speak. I've just heard second-hand reports about it. I'm a little disappointed in the television ads that I've seen, because, number one, it does not uh, mention the libertarian label. I, I think the main reason that someone in his position, or as I was in 1996 or 2000 to run, is to let people know that there's a better life available and that it is the libertarians that are presenting that better life. This, first of all, helps all the libertarians further down the ticket, some of whom actually do have a chance to win, unlike the presidential candidate. And if people know that that person is a libertarian and of the same stripe as the person they saw on national television, a presidential candidate, even though that presidential candidate had no chance to win, then they're going to be much more likely to vote for that candidate further down the ticket. Secondly, it helps to lay the groundwork for the next candidate coming along running for president, helps to build the party, helps to build name recognition, and I'm sorry that the uh, Bad Nara campaign isn't uh, really flaunting the libertarian label, and I think part of the reason is they turned to Aaron Rousseau, who was uh, one of Bad Nara's opponents in the a pre-convention run-up, and uh, turned to Aaron Russo to produce those ads, and Russo had definitely made a decision in his campaign not to use the libertarian label and to avoid it wherever possible. And uh, it just strikes me as a, an important question is, what is, ho what is the hope of achievement in this? What is it that they believe they're going to accomplish by running this campaign if they're not promoting the libertarian label? And I have made my thoughts known to the... Um, campaign managers, uh, Bad Narek's campaign managers, and I hope that something will be done about that, but we will see. As far as Bad Narek's articulation, I'm not in a position to comment because I haven't heard him that much, but what I have heard, I thought that he was able to express himself very well. So I haven't really told you anything, have I, uh, Brian? No, I mean, he expresses himself very well to me. I just don't see where he expresses himself well to people that don't share ideals. I don't think he needs to preach to the choir. He needs, you know, I think he needs to, um, like you do, tell people that don't know the alternative show you know and, and articulate to them that there is an alternative. I mean, yeah. We already know. I mean, sure. And I think you're I think you're touching on a very important point. Uh, and we've discussed this before on the show. And that is that if you want to attract people's uh, attention and their minds 
to listen to you, you've got to offer benefits. You've got to offer them something that is so much better than what they have now that it is worth listening to. And people do not want to talk about, people do not want to hear about problems they didn't know about before. They've got enough problems already in their own life. And so approaching them by saying that uh, things are really bad now, this is what the administration's doing, this is what Terry wants to do, and uh, they're just going to make things worse and so forth, when there are so many positive things we could be talking about, uh, about how much better your life could be without the income tax, how much better your retirement could be if we could get uh, let you out of Social Security, how much safer your city could be if we'd end this insane drug prohibition that has wrecked our communities just the way alcohol prohibition did, and how much safer our country could be and our cities could be if American foreign policy would uh, go back to the philosophy of Washington and Jefferson and so forth, and then explain how these things work. Uh, people will pay attention to that, even if they don't believe you if they've got a chance to win, and even if they don't believe you've got a chance to bring these things about. Brian, thanks so much for your call. I appreciate it. Welcome back. Harry Brown here. Let's continue talking on the telephone now with Ernie in New Jersey. Good evening, Ernie. Good evening. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Are you listening on the Internet or on the okay, radio? I, I was on the Internet. I only had one line, so I had to disconnect. Oh. <laughs> okay. I, no, I, agree. I was just curious. Yeah, I, was, I just want to say it's great what you're saying about the parties. American people are basically like sheep, like the slaughter now. System. Well, I, I hate to call them sheep because they're all thinking individuals, but too often they get sucked into this. I, I think it's very simple that somebody at some point says, well, I believe in smaller government, uh, and I believe that the Republicans believe that too, so I will support the Republicans. Or they say, I believe in civil liberties, uh, and I don't want to see America get into war, and so I'll stick with the Democrats. And then five years later they wake up and realize, or maybe they realize, maybe they don't, that their party has been selling them out on all the issues that they joined that party for in the first place, but by then it's too late because the other side is the devil, and if we don't vote for our own party, then the devil's going to take over, and America is really going to go to pot. Okay. We should have a positive thing, but I agree with you. Like, anybody but John Bone's cousins, the Bush or Kerry, everybody should register and vote, but not for John Bone's cousins. <laughs> Stolen Bones uh, being the uh, Yale secret society that both of them belonged to at one time or another. Yeah, it's bad, uh, bad. It, it, was, it was probably just a place where they watched stag movies. I don't know. It was much deeper than that, but... It's sad, but I always, I was basically, I'm an independent. Okay, when Clinton was in trouble, I, I, I detailed, people wouldn't believe, especially Democrats, how bad his, his character was, his drug, and his problem with sex. But Republicans, yeah, now Republicans get in there, and whatever Bush does it is like, like Hitler's law. It, it, it was blinded. Yes. See? Yeah, I uh, think that's uh, just about it. Well, I have to say that if you don't find somebody that you want to vote for, there is absolutely nothing wrong with not voting at all. You have no civic obligation to vote for people you don't believe in. And people who say, if you vote, don't vote, don't complain, just uh, say back to them, well, look, things are a mess and you voted, so you have no reason to complain because you're the ones who sanctioned this whole process. You're the ones who said, I'll agree to abide by whoever gets elected. Well, I don't agree to abide by it. I just am forced to abide by it because uh, they will pass laws that will make me abide by it. But the point is, you don't have to vote for somebody you don't believe in. You don't have to choose among the lesser of two evils. I like the libertarians. That's no secret. But if you don't happen to like the libertarians, that doesn't mean uh, that you should vote for a Republican or Democrat. Just don't vote at all if you don't want to because it only encourages them. Well, you have the Constitution Party, you have maybe anybody better than Democrat, Republican, anybody. Sure. It's all but, against happy gas, basically, you know, all against that other stuff. That, Right, but if you don't really believe in those third-party candidates, don't vote for them either because that's just the same as a Democrat voting for anybody but Bush or a Republican voting for Bush because he can't stand Kerry. Don't vote because they are just seem to be not as bad as the others. Only vote for somebody who really is promoting what you want to see happen. And if there's nobody that's doing that, then just simply don't vote at all because that in itself is a vote. It's sending a message. Right now, 50% of the people who are eligible to vote don't vote, and that figure keeps getting larger and larger as time goes by, and that's got to be sending a message to some people, and at some point, maybe it will of itself help to affect some kind of change. I can't promise that, but I could tell you this, that voting for somebody you don't believe in certainly doesn't affect the change in the direction that you want to go. Hey. Thanks so much for calling, Ernie. I really appreciate it, and I'm glad uh, that you're listening to the show, and I'm glad you were able to get through and make the connection on the Internet. Let's go right back to the phones and talk with James in Oregon. Good evening, James. Good evening, Harry. What's up? Um, well, you, you started the show talking about uh, uh, voting and all, and mm -hmm. uh, I thought I'd share with you a thought I've had... Oh, I'm getting static. Are you still there? Yeah. After, that's not coming from your phone, huh? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Well, maybe it's that storm in Florida. Who knows? Um, am I still coming through? Uh, I'm hearing you all right. Oh, good. Well, I thought I should... Uh, Hello? Yeah, we're all right now, I think. Oh, good. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, I thought I'd share um, a thought I had. And it was simply that um, I don't think there's been a better time in this country in recent history to vote for a third party. Um, the thought was simply, if you're a disillusioned Republican, and there are a lot of them out there, you can vote Libertarian as an alternative to the Republican 
viewpoint, or at least what it was. Mm -hmm. If you're a disillusioned Democrat, you can vote for Ralph Nader because he's sort of a the Democrat, the, the, sort of the sane uh, person on the Democrat side. So, I mean, either one is, is a very good, in my mind, alternative to whichever political philosophy you, uh, you care to um, name. I, I'm hoping, I mean, in a perfect world, I, I would have Bagnarek saying this to, you know, potential voters. You know, if you're a disillusioned Republican, vote for us. If you're a disillusioned Democrat, vote for Ralph Nader. I'd like to see, and, of course, Ralph Nader plugging the Libertarian Party. But, of course, that's not going to happen, but... What I'm saying is um, I hope the, the ranks of both third parties will swell. Well, we will see. Badnerick has uh, produced one radio ad appealing to disillusioned conservatives. He doesn't refer to Republicans, but no. the conservatives, and saying, well, yes, he does refer to the Republicans, I believe, saying the Republicans have really deserted uh, traditional conservative values, and that if you are upset and want to see traditional conservative values, you'd be a lot closer to the Libertarian Party. So to a certain extent, they're taking your advice on that, and I really don't know what Ralph Nader is saying, so I can't comment on that side. Yeah, um, actually, I've called him before. He's sort of the anti-corporate uh, uh, message. Um, there are a lot of people worried about the corporate takeover of uh, our, our society, essentially. And right. No, what I meant was I don't know whether he is uh, pushing the idea that if you're a disillusioned Democrat, now is the time to vote for a third party to try to make a difference. Oh, so, uh, neither do I. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. But uh, I understand your point, and I, I agree with it, that it is something uh, to, to be saying to people that you know who are Republicans, conservatives, whatever. And um, so I hope that uh, we'll see some progress in that regard and more respect for third parties by the end of the um, campaign. Thanks so much for your call, James. Well, I now am going to change the subject to something you probably never, ever, ever, ever think about, the war in Iraq. Well something you haven't thought about for a minute and a half or so anyway. An interesting article appeared in the Washington Post on Thursday, and it is entitled, The Post on WMDs, An Inside Story. Pre-war articles questioning threat often didn't make front page. And what it is is a mea couple, <laughs> couple uh, given by the Washington Post, admitting that they did not do the best job possible in alerting people to the fact that the administration was dispensing as certain knowledge things that couldn't possibly be certain knowledge in the days before the war in Iraq started. And it, the gist of it is that the Post did publish skeptical viewpoints about the war in Iraq, dissenting viewpoints, but it usually published the administration's assertions on the front page while the skeptical material wound up back somewhere further down. For instance, here's a quote from the article. Quote, the paper was not front-paging stuff, unquote, said Pentagon correspondent Thomas Ricks. Quote, administration assertions were on the front page. Things that challenged the administration were on A18 on Sunday or A24 on Monday. There was an attitude among ed editors, look, we're going to war. Why do we even worry about all this contrary stuff? End of quote. In re retrospect, said executive editor Leonard Downey Jr., quote, we were so focused on trying to figure out what the administration was doing that we were not giving the same play to people who said it wouldn't be a good idea to go to war and were questioning the administration's rationale. Not enough of these stories were put on the front page. That was a mistake on my part, end of quote. And the article, which is very, very lengthy, uh, really goes into a lot of details on what happened. Let me give you another excerpt. From August 2002 through the March 19, 2003 launch of the war, the Post ran more than 140 front-page stories that focused heavily on administration rhetoric against Iraq. Some examples. Cheney says Iraqi strike is justified. War cabinet argues for Iraq attack. Bush tells United Nations it must stand up to Hussein or U.S. will. Bush cites urgent Iraqi threat. Bush tells troops prepare for war. Reporter Karen DeYoung, a former assistant managing editor who covered the pre-war diplomacy, said contrary information sometimes got lost. Quote, if there's something I would do differently, and it's always easy in hindsight, the top of the story would say, we're going to war, we're going to war against evil, but later down it would say, but some people are questioning it. The caution and the questioning was buried underneath the drumbeat. The hugeness of the war preparation story tended to drown out a lot of that stuff. And on and on it goes. Well, it's nice that they even acknowledge this. Most papers would not do so. And the thing that bothers me the most about all of this is that all discussions about what happened s seem to be on the order of, well, like this was a budget miscalculation or something didn't turn out quite the way we expected it to. And, yes, mistakes were made and it's too bad and let's hope that they don't make the next time. And what is left out of all this? What is the one thing that is never discussed in all these discussions of how the press didn't live up to its responsibility, and that mistakes were made, and so on. What is left out is the concept of death. Almost a 1,000 Americans are dead because of what happened. Tens of thousands of Iraqis are dead. 
These are people who were somebody's husband, wife, son, daughter, father. These are people who had lives to live, just as you and I had lives to live, and they are dead, and their families are mourning them. And in America, people are talking about, well, mistakes were made. You know, I have a lot of respect for John Stewart of The Daily Show on Comedy Central. As I mentioned last week, it was the only show before the Iraqi war that did exercise any skepticism. A couple of weeks ago, Stewart had on as his guest Wolf Blitzer of CNN. And Stewart kept saying, well, what happened? How did this happen that America went to war this way when there were no weapons of mass destruction and there was no al-Qaeda connection and so on? And Blitzer said, well, it's a case of, oops, we made a mistake. You know, these things happen. They happen in business. They happen every place that people make mistakes. And Stewart kept pressing him and pressing him. But the interesting thing is that neither Blitzer or Stewart ever mentioned the people who died because of this mistake. My God, people died. Doesn't that mean anything to anybody? No, it doesn't, because it wasn't their family members who died. Deaths are just statistics when it's somebody else. As Stalin said, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is just a statistic. And the fact of the matter is that it doesn't really matter. It's just a question of, well, how many people did we lose? Well, that's not too bad for what we gained. Uh, that's too, not too big a loss to take to win that particular battle or whatever. When Michael Moore was on as a guest with Bill O'Reilly, Moore really zeroed in. In the middle of the interview, he suddenly started asking Bill O'Reilly, who, of course, was defending the war. Moore said, would you sacrifice your son for Fallujah? And O'Reilly wouldn't answer the question. He said, well, I would go there and die for Fallujah. And Moore said, that's irrelevant because you're not going to go there to die. You and I are too old to fight, so we send our sons to do it. So would you sacrifice your son for Fallujah? And O'Reilly still wouldn't answer. And he, Moore asked him a third time, and O'Reilly wouldn't answer. And later, uh, on a later broadcast, O'Reilly actually replayed the interview and said, uh, showing that he had won. And he said that Moore's asking that question was resorting to emotional tactics because Moore had lost on the facts. Well, it may be emotional, but nothing could be more relevant than would you sacrifice your son for Fallujah. Harry Brown here. Glad you stayed with me. And my <laughs> email, or actually the server that uh, takes care of my email and my website, has been intermittent all evening long. And I guess it intermittent long enough to get just one email through a moment ago. And that was from Brian, who called in earlier. And he had called and spoken about the uh, Michael Badnera campaign and had a few reservations about it. But he emailed to say, I still think that Harry should give an endorsement to Michael Badnerick. I agree the campaign is approaching things wrong, but we still support him and vote for him. I still believe he holds the right ideals and is the only choice to say you want to reduce the size of government. Well, I agree with you that he is the only choice by which you can tell the world through voting that you want to reduce the size of government. So as I've said over and over for the past few months, the only possible choices are to vote for Badnerick or not vote at all. And I will not demean the idea of not voting at all. I believe that that is a respectable choice. But if you are going to vote and you want some more government, you have to vote libertarian. Anything else is just going to confuse the issue and support people who are making government larger. Well, let's go to Frank now in New Mexico and see what's uh, on the docket. Good evening, Frank. Good evening, Harry. Did you call to tell us you were ready to die to get Sam Saddam Hussein out of power? <laughs> Certainly not. Um, I agree with everything that you were, you were talking about there, and I think I read something uh, that you published earlier which said essentially the same thing. I was wondering actually how uh, a libertarian society might, hand, might uh, uh, dole out justice to a president who sent us to war and was responsible for the deaths of thousands of people um, and, and on, false, on false premises. Well, I don't have a complete and definitive answer to that, but I think the essence of the answer is that politicians must be made personally responsible for the damage that they do. Now, I understand that people fear that if politicians were made personally responsible, they would be afraid to vote for lots of different things. Well, all I can say is hooray, because politicians shouldn't be voting for all the things that they're voting for. They shouldn't be voting for student loans. Uh, they shouldn't be voting for power companies owned by the federal government. They shouldn't be voting for all of these various programs. They shouldn't be voting for the interstate road system. None of those things are constitutional functions of the U.S. government, and in fact, the constitutional functions are just very, very few to provide for the national defense, and incidentally, that's national defense, not national offense. And they should be providing uh, the post office and so on. When I say should, I mean constitutionally they are authorized to. I'm not saying it's a great idea, but that's what the Constitution says. And if they were limited to those areas and then voted for something that damaged people, uh, then they should be held accountable for it. But when they, when they vote for things that take money away from us and uh, put people out of work in the process and so on, they should be made to pay for it. Now, how much and in what way, I can't really say. I haven't tried to figure it out to that extent. But, of course, you have put your finger on the most egregious crime at all, of all, and that is sending people to their death. And Bush 
likes to put it on the terms that, well, we didn't know, and it was better to err on the side of caution. No, he didn't err on the side of caution. He erred on the side of recklessness. Caution would have said, look, if we're wrong about this, we're going to incite more terrorists to attack the United States of America. We're going to incite more terrorists to attack American troops wherever they are in the world. We are going to make more trouble for the United States. And so as a result, we should be very, very careful about doing this. We should not do it until we have definitive e evidence. And when people say that Bush didn't lie, they are mistaken. When when you make a statement that something is absolutely true and that you have the evidence for it and you know where the weapons of mass destruction are and so on, then saying later that you got false information is no excuse because you lied. You said you had the evidence. You said you knew this for certainty, and so you should be held accountable for it. But I'm not really answering your question, am I? Uh, no, I think you, I think you are. Um, you're not uh, coming right out and saying uh, my own opinion. I, I've oh, been, go ahead. I've been reading, uh, I've been reading uh, Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard recently, and and uh, he comes out and says that, you know, in, in the case of police who kill somebody in, in the pursuit of an arrest or something, that if it turns out that the person they killed uh, was innocent, then they should be put on trial for their own life. And uh, I guess I would like to uh, see that extended uh, uh, from police out to politicians as well. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And um, it's just a question of, uh, you know, exactly what should the penalty be. In the case you uh, cited of a policeman killing an innocent person in a police chase, uh, the, probably the crime should be the same as it would be for a civilian who killed somebody. It might not necessarily be first-degree murder, a capital crime, but it might be second-degree murder. It might be manslaughter. As long as uh, anything like that is applied to civilians, it ought to be supplied to the police as well. Uh, it, that brings up another point, incidentally. There is a lot of feeling that the police should be given a lot of slack on that because their job is so dangerous. It's interesting that there's a government website, and I will dig it out of my drawer here when we take the next break, that has cited the dangers in various kinds of jobs. In other words, the number of fatalities per 1,000 people who work in that field. And law enforcement is quite a, a long way down the list, surprisingly enough. As I recall, the most dangerous job in America is timber cutters that the death rate in that industry is far, far higher. It's something like ten times as great as it is in law enforcement. So the point is that law enforcement officials, while I admire many of them and I understand the difficulties of their job and the difficulties of making split-second decisions, the fact of the matter is they still should be responsible for what they do. And if sometimes a guilty person gets off free because a cop didn't shoot him when he had the chance, that's better than it's better that five of them or ten guilty people get free that way than that one innocent person gets shot. Well, I'm certainly with you there, Harry. And uh, just before I go here, I'll just uh, throw out that I'm, I'm over here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We had a visit from Michael Bednarico on Wednesday, and uh, it, went, it was a wonderful speech. Um, and uh, he's really inspiring a lot of libertarians here in New Mexico. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I um, will have to make a point to hear one of these speeches myself at some point. He, he's a constitutionalist. Yes, I understand. And, and, and I can, you know, I don't entirely agree with that point of view, but I can, I can certainly feel like I'm rowing in the same direction, if you know what I mean. Sure. Thanks so much for calling, Frank. When I was talking with Frank in New Mexico... I mentioned about the fatality rates, and this is from the Department of Labor in Washington, and you know how accurate government statistics are. Anyway, they say that timber cutters are ten times as likely to die on the job as policemen are. Fishers, pilots, and navigators are six times as likely to die as law enforcement people. Structural metal workers, five times as likely. Drivers, sales workers, roofers, electrical power installers, three times as likely. Truck drivers, uh, farm workers, construction laborers twice as likely, and so on. They don't put it in quite those terms, but if you take the uh, statistics that they give you, you can calculate this for yourself and come up with these comparisons with law enforcement workers. I don't have the website address in front of me, but I will try to put it up on the Radio Links page so you can take a look. It's done in chart form. And I have been informed by our Internet service provider that the website and everything else is working now, and as a result, I just received a batch of questions from individuals. Ed in Maine says, I'm forwarding a letter regarding the Maine Democratic Party opposition to question one, which is a cap on property taxes. And Ed says, I was a Maine delegate to the Democratic National Convention in Boston. It's a long story, but the short of it is that I pledged and voted for Dennis Kucinich, whose voting record is consistent with that of Ron Paul and Russ Feingold. Dennis's view on the insane war on drugs and American hegemony is consistent with Harry Brown. Yes, he is a flake, but we don't have to dwell on that. <laughs> Those are Ed's words, not mine. He says, I'm still on the state committee and will support anyone who supports question one. That's capping the property taxes. And it limits property taxes to 1%. I find that Marshall Fritz's world's smallest education survey comes in handy when convincing others that 3% property tax is unreal, unreasonable. 
And Marshall Fritz is the foremost exponent in this country right now of getting government completely out of schools, which would, of course, sharply reduce property taxes. And as Ed is saying, you don't need a 3% property tax. Uh, 1% would be enough as far as Ed's concerned. And hearing from Maximo out in cyberspace, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. The Swiss copied their current system from the Articles of Confederation of the United States. If states such as New Mexico, if the Free State Project succeeds, were to unratify the Constitution and go back to the Articles of Confederation, it wouldn't be of much consequence who is president. And I'm sure um, that Maximo is referring here to the discussion we just had about the consequences for politicians. And he's pointing out... Uh, Quote, yet the first president under the Great Seal, John Hansen, wound up the revolu in the Revolutionary War, got good concessions from the British, and set the country on the right path all in one year, despite, despite having truly limited powers, as do Swiss presidents today. And Maximo is referring to the fact that the Swiss elect a parliament which appoints a Swiss council of, I believe it's seven members, and those seven members rotate the presidency, uh, each serving one year. And the president doesn't get a limo. He doesn't get any special Secret Service protection. And it's always been a joke that the Swiss president rides to work every day on the Swiss streetcars. Going back to Maximo's email, he says, You have to admit that today's U.S. simply offers too great an opportunity for abuse. Amen, Maximo, given the options on the current menu. Thus, it's better to reboot a hacker-proof operating system than one which is hacker-prone. And all of this has proven Patrick Henry correct. Maximo is referring to the fact that Patrick Henry opposed the Constitution. His famous speech was given in support of the Declaration of Independence, but when the Constitution was debated later, Henry thought it gave the government too much power. Maximo goes on to say, why aren't libertarians more like Patrick Henry? Why don't they support the Articles as part of the LP platform? It seems only fringe groups like the Free State Project will even consider the Ar Articles of Confederation as a potential option. Maybe so. All right. We have an email from Jonathan who's desperately trying to connect to the show over the internet and Jan out in cyberspace says because my website is down a link to the show that works and you might want to make a note of this because uh, we might have a problem like this in the future but he said go to www.infowars.com slash genesis and then click on the genesis one stream link I'll try this after the show and if it works I will then put that up on the radio links page as an option for you that you can try well, we've been talking tonight about voting and about politics and uh, various things of that sort. And I think it's important to realize that you, I've said you don't have an obligation to vote. You also don't have an obligation to save the world. You don't have an obligation to do anything that is going to interfere with what is best for you and your family. And, of course, those are areas where you have a great deal of control over the outcome, when you're doing something for yourself or doing something for your family. When you try to change the world, of course, you don't have direct control. You have to hope that you are going to convince others to help. And that's not an easy task. Believe me, I know. I've been trying for 40 years. I hope that you will do what you can. I hope you'll call into other radio talk shows and voice your opinion. I hope you will uh, write letters to the editors of newspapers. But I don't want you to sacrifice your own life to do it. Make the most of your life. Do something for yourself this week and don't be too depressed. But also, don't forget to tune in again next week and we'll have the server working. We'll have a good connection. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much for being with me this evening. I look forward to talking with you again next week. Good night.